We as a society should validate uniqueness and individual differences and not judge it, devalue it, invalidate it, make fun of it, whatever. All of that is traumatic in the end. And then you have people with complex post-traumatic stress injury on top of autism instead of giving support and cherishing all that talent that gets lost in the process of so stubbornly wanting a norm. This was just shared by Axia. Research shows that having a positive understanding of your autistic identity is an indicator of higher self-esteem and well-being as an adult. So often, autistic young people are told to stop stimming, taught neurotypical social skills and disciplined because of characteristics directly related to their autistic identity. So, for example, math. In order to attend university, you have to be good at math. But not everybody is, because we have different brains. Temple Grandin points that out. She is, like me, a visual thinker, an object visualizer, and we tend to suck at math. So already, just because you are not good at math, you are excluded. This, in my book, is a form of discrimination. You don't get access to higher education because of that one thing that you don't excel in. Temple Grandin was so lucky that she could attend college and she had a lot of support. For me, it turned out rather differently. And I just don't understand why you would need math to study psychology. You don't need math in psychology. What you need is empathy. And the push and pressure that is put on you to fit in and be like everybody else it's traumatic. Hi, I'm Donna Williams and I'm going to talk a bit about gender identity and dissociation. Um, when I was two, I, um, I split into a male identity and I remember when this happened and I was sleeping under the bed um, because of the situation I was living in it was so Things have been happening to me that were so traumatizing and threatening that the only way to feel safe was first to try to sleep down in the side of the bed and then to sleep under the bed. And um, I couldn't dare to sleep. And I could feel this kind of presence outside of me. It was really strong and um, it felt adult. And um, I was really quite terrified 
of things that have been going on and tired out and burned out. And I remember letting this feeling become part of me and the me that I was, I just let it go. So I guess it's kind of like dying in a sense. But instead there was this other person who was incredibly, felt powerful and it didn't really matter what happened to it because it didn't feel like me. And so originally there'd been this very sensory me. So I used to make movement out of things all the time, make all the fabric fly and, you know, loved um, the smell of blossoms and bees and um, looking at light and rubbing my eyes and making colour and I loved the sounds of things and I loved to um, love textures. And then I was this other person and the person I became was someone who, who glared and who would get you know, really stiff and give people the sort of like, get out, get away, you know, you're invading, you're intruding. And I was this person who would merely tolerate um, people. And it was a very strong male identity. And as I got older, when I was four, I split again. And this time, um, I guess it coincided with the death of my grandfather and my grandmother being moved out the same week. So I effectively lost my carers in one week. And I, um, I remembered um, bonding with the, the mirror, really, and believing in her and that she was Carol. So she was a female identity. And I desperately wanted... Uh, to feel safe, I wanted to feel yeah. like I had somebody. I wanted to feel um, what it was to to join with someone who I could trust. And yes. because my world was so fragmented and I couldn't see people as a whole, and I'm very face blind, the only person who had any familiarity was this girl in the mirror. And then I kind of projected onto her all the things that would make me be safe and what would make me be safe would be to try to be just like the other kids see it's to me absolutely logical to split into a part of you that is stronger so you don't feel so threatened or alone or misunderstood and it's all about feeling safe and if the environment doesn't make you feel safe what else can you do you dissociate to some minor extents for most and for some people they split they create out of necessity some other personalities I absolutely get it It's the only way to survive a threatening environment. So here you have a quite recent study, January 24, 2022, exploring potential sources of childhood trauma, a qualitative study with autistic adults and caregivers. So the abstract says the stressors autistic individuals encounter and experience as traumatic may vary from non-autistics. We conducted a qualitative study to identify potential sources of trauma for autistic individuals and evaluate correspondence with a standard measure. We enrolled autistic adults, N equals 14, 
and caregivers n equals 15. So it's not a big study, but still it can help to point out that trauma in autistic individuals is rather the norm, in my opinion, than the exception, unfortunately. So it says with varied adversities, levels of functioning and socio demographics. Participants completed standard measures of autism, traumatic exposures and stress, and qualitative interviews which were submitted to thematic analysis. A wide range of experiences were described as traumatic, whereas some reflected traditional traumas, e.g. maltreatment and forms of social marginalization, which I find important because you can have on one hand the autistic traumatization specific to autism due to sensory sensitivities and invalidation, devaluation, gaslighting, telling you what you experience you don't experience because nobody else is having this experience blah blah so also being constantly told um, look all the other kids are fine why aren't you so this gives you a sense of not being like the others less than and stuff like that however you also can have completely traditional trauma such as an alcoholic parent your parents arguing all the time um, and relationship trauma and stuff like that um, which the neurotypical norm also gets traumatized from so for the autistic individual it can be both anyway so others reflected conflicts between autistic characteristics and the environment e.g sensory trauma yes that's what i just said um, all adults and caregivers described sources of trauma in interviews not captured by standardized measures and that's exactly the problem so you get traumatized you have complex ptsd but then people tell you oh you're not traumatized nobody gets traumatized from that stuff like that so again invalidation on top of already being traumatized um yeah so it's a vicious cycle very stressful experiences many not detected by standardized measure that's why i say we need a specific category for autistic complex ptsd it doesn't exist so far may have a traumatic effect on autistic individuals whereas some reflect commonly recognized trauma sources others may reflect particular vulnerabilities for autistic individuals yes exactly results have implications for assessing traumatic events and understanding their contribution to mental health inequities in the autistic population and I'm glad they point this out here. The stressors autistic individuals encounter and experience as traumatic may vary from those not on the spectrum and typically measured. We conducted in-depth interviews with autistic adults and caregivers of children and adults on the spectrum to identify potential sources of trauma for autistic individuals 
and evaluate the ability of a standard trauma measure to capture those experiences. Trauma, though often a diagnostic term in an event designated to cause stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in diagnostic manuals, can also be defined more broadly as an event or circumstance that is experienced as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has lasting adverse effects on functioning and well-being. This definition underscores the trauma often encompasses a wider range of outcomes than PTSD alone and results not only from an experience but also from one's appraisal of an ability to cope with that experience. There is thus strong rationale to examine individual narratives regarding trauma sources in an open-ended manner to inform the design and interpretation of more top-down quantitative investigations. This may be particularly true for autistic individuals whose experiences, appraisals and coping may vary from non-autistics. Autistic characteristics may influence the experience of trauma at multiple levels, altering not only the rate of potentially traumatic events, but also the range of experiences appraised as traumatic. Yeah, I mean, already being pushed to fit in like everybody else and failing doing so. That's traumatic. Because you feel shitty about yourself and your self-esteem is crushed. In support of these theories, studies suggest that only increased rates of PT among autistic individuals but also enhanced vulnerability to PTSD. Various adversities are also implicated in the prevalent mental health concerns observed among autistic individuals, and recent studies suggest PTSD may develop in this population in response to a broad range of experiences including bullying, psychological breakdowns, unexpected sounds, misunderstandings and life transitions. Nonetheless, research has relied upon measures developed for non-autistics. Such measures may omit the adversities experienced as most traumatic by those on the spectrum and impinge our ability to identify the full breadth of experiences that contribute to poor health outcomes in autism, including but not limited to PTSD. As such, we conducted a qualitative study with autistic adults and caregivers to explore potential sources of trauma for autistic individuals. We also examined the congruence between qualitative findings and the frequency of PTE reported on a standard questionnaire. An ultimate goal was to develop an inclusive list of PTE grounded in the personal accounts of autistic adults and caregivers to ensure that hypotheses and measures utilized in future quantitative studies and ultimately clinical practice are appropriately tailored to the autistic population, informed by their priorities and equipped to evaluate the full range of events that may have a traumatic impact. Finally, wow! This is finally acknowledged and hopefully we will not push medication because that's actually useless 
for healing trauma. <laughs> As studies have already proven in non-autistic people with PTSD. So I hope this is not the end goal to push medication on the autistic population more so than ever. But actually see the latest research on nervous system based trauma therapies internal family system emdr neurofeedback all of that but also use mdma ketamine and psilocybin all these substances that now come out in studies to really be the most helpful for complex PTSD. Here for example MDMA assisted therapy for severe PTSD. But already you are excluding people with complex traumatic stress injury. And so far the law is that you have to go through lots of supposedly helpful treatment for PTSD before you even can have access to these substances and that's just so backwards the option of substance assisted psychotherapy so i mean was that not just mdma but ketamine infusions for example, or psilocybin and many say ayahuasca is extremely helpful. So in my opinion, this should become standard treatment for complex post-traumatic stress injury. So you get a reset and you can access childhood trauma, which is non-verbal because talk therapy just doesn't work. Studies show that over and over and over again. So It should not be that just a very few can access this form of psychotherapy. Because like that it's just being dragged on and um, somebody who experiences post-traumatic stress injury doesn't have that time it's hell to be in chronic anxiety or chronic fight flight getting constantly triggered you need a solution for that ASAP so they need to do studies for autistics with complex post-traumatic stress injury very quickly, in my opinion.
And this is a video about dissociation on the autism spectrum. Uh, when people think about dissociation, uh, often they'll think about, you know, dis disso dissociative disorders like um, DID, dissociative identity disorder. And a lot of people uh, presume that dissociative identity disorder is a personality disorder. In fact, it's not. It's part of a spectrum of dissociative disorders, and it's an extreme form of post-traumatic stress disorder. So being a person who is diagnosed uh, at age two as somebody with autism, so I was diagnosed as psychotic when I was age two because in the 1960s, autism was childhood psychosis. And simultaneously being a person who came to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and then the extreme of that dissociative identity disorder, there's been, you know, um, a lot of people take quite an interest in does one cancel out the other? And if not, can people with autism experience dissociation? Can people with uh, autism experience post-traumatic stress disorder? And can people with autism um, so uh, experience such a degree of chronic stress and traumatization that they could develop defense mechanisms such as splitting and um, uh, having different identities that become triggered in different situations. Well, obviously, there are some people with autism that that doesn't happen to, who are relatively happy, well-adjusted people with no chronic anxiety. There are people with autism who have chronic anxiety from the time they're diagnosed, sometimes at two or three years old, um, who anxiety is such a huge feature of their autism that if they didn't have that chronic anxiety, chances are they would be able to dare a lot more development. They'd be able to, they wouldn't have selective mutism if they had that. They wouldn't have dependent stuff and led helplessness if not for some of their anxiety they may not have developed OCD they may not have the level of tics that they have they might not have developed school phobia or a whole lot of complications that can come together with um, having a chronic anxiety state so clearly there are some people with autism who for them a large part of their fruit salad is chronic anxiety states but is that enough to make a person dissociate or is dissociating something a bit separate to just an anxiety disorder? Well, um, people dissociate when they're extremely uncomfortable. Um, they can be uncomfortable for a whole range of reasons. And anxiety is one of those reasons. And obviously, I think we've established that for some people with autism, anxiety is a very large part of what makes their, the other aspects of their autism so extreme. And if they were not so anxious, a lot of their issues would would be much easier for them to, to tackle. Um, another uh, form of, of finding life so overwhelming that you would dissociate may be something like um, having extreme exposure anxiety. Now, exposure anxiety sounds just like anxiety, but it's actually something sort of special. Anxiety is an um, involuntary self-protection response that becomes quite chronic. You could almost say that exposure anxiety is like um, a, a DID, a dissociative identity disorder state, in its early form. So exposure anxiety manifests as involuntary avoidance, diversion and retaliation responses. And what that means is that the person, when you go to um, get somebody with high exposure anxiety to, to join you in something, they may involuntarily just tune you out, avoid, be unable to acknowledge the request. If you keep persisting, they may keep diverting, drawing your attention to something completely irrelevant or seeming really, really busy with something that has nothing to do with what you're requesting. Um, if you continue, you may find that they attack themselves or they might attack you. Even if that's something they've really wanted to do, they may say no, 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 all the behaviours that are associated with absolutely no. People with exposure anxiety, unfortunately, become so patterned into this involuntary self-protection, very hair-triggered state, that in a socially invasive world, a world where therapists, parents, 
um, teachers appear to be constantly pursuing, invading, force feeding them with levels of gush and fuss and intimacy and control that they um, are not um, able to desensitize from. They build higher and higher sense of phobic invasion. And that's why I'm saying that these special therapies are so important to just help cut through this high state of stress and anxiety. If you are in constant fight, flight, then you just react to any trigger. And the goal is to bring you down to the parasympathetic rest and digest state. Only from there you can actually begin to heal that trauma and stop constantly reacting and being triggered. It's like a reset and you can work with a clean slate, reduce anxiety. might think, well, what's that got to do with dissociation? Well, dissociation is about um, a triggered response in which the person dissociates, cuts off from uh, what they're experiencing. So daydreaming is an example of common day dissociation that all human beings do. If you have exposure anxiety, you may stare as if in a daydream far more regularly than most people because your avoidance responses are on such a hair trigger um, mechanism. Um, Depersonalization, um, not uh, taking those, taking what happens to you personally, viewing it as if you're an outsider, um, uh, not taking your life personally, having no emotional response to what's going on. And yet this is um, uh, very similar with exposure anxiety where the person will divert into a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with what they're actually feeling. Um, or... Um, uh, with um, uh, with derealization, that feeling that you're watching your life as if it's a movie, things feel quite unreal, you're not quite sure, you know, is this a dream, is this a real, real life? Well, with exposure anxiety, one of the things that people with it will commonly do is they'll become the family cat, they'll become the family dog, they'll become a character on the TV. This is very similar to the sort of splitting that you see in dissociative identity disorder. So for a person with autism, this starts out as part of how they're able to reduce that level of intense exposure before others, i.e. it wasn't me who got a drink, the cat I, as a cat, needed it. Um, it wasn't me who got a drink. It was that TV character who went and got it. It wasn't me who went to school. You know, it was the family dog. And um, if you work as a professional in the autism field, sooner or later you'll come across kids who become a cat, a dog, various animals, TV characters, um, even become other children who are in their class as a means of handling certain types of things. And then they'll switch back out of that when, um, when that extreme exposure anxiety is not so challenging. So there's one relationship between something that very commonly goes on in people with autism, which is exposure anxiety, and probably affects around 30 to 50% of people with autism, and something like dissociative processes that include dissociation, depersonalization, and derealization. Um, uh, when children are small, um, all children dissociate. 
when you're making children do something that they find uncomfortable or they're unable to do, they will sort of step out of their hands, step out of their body, go floppy, stare. Um, they'll stare into space. They'll play things out in their head. They'll go to a happier space than what's going on. The teacher will say, come on, stop daydreaming. We're doing this. And for a lot of children, that they'll progressively toughen up handle more and more challenges and that's part of their normal development for a lot of kids with autism they become masters of dissociative processes so that um instead of people saying come on snap out of it you're in a daydream they say oh that one's autistic um uh, and what exactly does that mean that one's dissociating all the time do they actually mean that person finds it so hard to process the visual, verbal and physical information that they dissociate far more quickly and far more often than the children who can process at a normal rate of incoming information. In which case we're actually saying that autistic kids employ dissociative processes far more commonly, far more often, far more intensively and throughout a longer period of childhood if not their life than non-autistic children. So there's a relationship between autism and dissociation. Now dissociation is a way of sort of taking the heat off and a lot of um, kids with autism will do this particularly with um, eating. So rather than taking the responsibility of they are the one who is eating the food with the fork, they'll stare into space and, and the other person will have to essentially feed them because they, they are struggling with handling perhaps the invasion of being expected to eat food. Maybe they um, uh, have the sort of personality that, that has, feels social invasion a lot more extremely. Um, it could be that they just feel that their life as a person with significant information processing problems feels so much more out of control for them than it would for a non-autistic child that what other people see as simple interactions feel absolutely overwhelming, confusing, over-controlling and overwhelmingly invasive to them. And what do we do when we feel extremely invaded when we feel out of control of our lives when we feel almost socially raped by uh, our life circumstances things that we have no communication to argue back we have no um uh no sort of level of equality to stand our ground or explain our situation what do we do we dissociate so we cut off, we go into our own head, we, we play out something from some other time and space, a TV show, um, some facts, something to distract ourselves into, or we'll just stare through a spot on the wall until we feel we're not there. Toileting is another one. The number of children that I've seen as an autism consultant who basically dissociate from their hands and their body as soon as they are put on the toilet or as soon as um, there's any expectation that they will do the wiping, etc., etc. And if this goes together with um, uh, various toilet phobias like this uh, bladder shyness and bowel shyness, people who um, just can't connect to their bodies as soon as they feel someone's watching or can hear them, then what you have is a situation of learned helplessness. And it's learned helplessness because the person is chronically dissociating from their body. And there are strategies to stop people from constantly dissociating, um, but uh, bull at a gate forcing them uh, through the activity, whilst that may progressively teach some people that there was nothing to be afraid of for other people it'll actually compound the dissociation so for those people an indirectly confrontational approach is essential what you're talking about there is how to get people off guard how to get people to feel that what you're doing is not a social invasion and some of the strategies for that are for example working off to the side instead of in front of the person addressing the object and issue that's outside of the person not addressing them directly keeping things low-key 
um, keeping things in small doses, leaving the situation um, as soon as you can so that they have time to relax before this escalates to a point of dissociation. Some of the strategies um, may also be things like um, becoming a character yourself, so becoming a TV character, becoming um, an animal, so that they don't feel they're in the company of someone who is watching, waiting, wanting, fixating on them as a case. And if you think about, um, you know, that, that sort of pregnant pause sort of state where you, you, you know that, that people are about to, to sort of jump on your case and, um, you know, everyone's waiting it's, it raises that sense of exposure. It raises that feeling of being in the spotlight. So you have to use an approach um, that is going to reduce that feeling of the spotlight. So do people with autism develop something further, something other than just the daydreaming and switching off and going into their own head of dissociation? Do they develop depersonalization? where they become quite formal and they avoid intimacy and they deflect closeness and they avoid interpersonal emotions? Well, of course they do because there's around an 80% overlap between schizoid personality disorder and um, being on the autism spectrum. So a lot of people with autism are far more likely to develop an, an anxiety about intimacy and develop a kind of formality and distancing, develop a depersonalization process as part of managing um, social emotional reality they're not ready for, they don't feel at ease with. And if the reason why autistics have a need to dissociate is because the environment feels threatening and invasive because they're pushed into behaving like everybody else to fit in and that creates massive stress and anxiety and therefore what else can you do than dissociate and withdraw and isolate because that's the only option you have to feel safe in an environment that doesn't really accept difference. So the results were quite frightening from 14 participants in this study on trauma in autistic individuals, physical abuse 11 from 14, emotional abuse 9, Sexual abuse 5 and bullying 14 out of 14. So every single one of these study participants was bullied. That's really bad. It just shows if you're different, you suffer. The intolerance of our Western society of people who are different. Neglect 4 out of 14. I thought that this would be higher. Hmm. Rick Dublin is the founder of MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. He did it in the 80s because he wanted to become a psychedelic therapist himself the moment MDMA became illegal. So he tried to create a, an institutional entity to make it possible again. And uh, yeah, 35 years later, um, MDMA is now um, in phase three study for PTSD. He will 
tell you everything about this. One thing maybe I would like to mention is that um, an article on the MAPS blog from 2006 from Andrew Sewell was the inspiration for us in the beginning to create the first student association in Switzerland. So if we are here today, it's also really because of Rick Dobrin and his awareness work. So thank you so much. So um, it has been uh, now 36 and a half years since I've started MAPS. And um, just to um, have a touch point in Switzerland, this is um, around uh, 40 years ago, almost. This is me and Albert Hoffman. And the reason I'm showing this, uh, I want to mention that it was a few years after that that Albert came to Esalen for the meetings in 1985 when we were planning how to uh, protect the therapeutic use of MDMA. So it's now been uh, 36 years of uh, psychedelic science through MAPS, um, April 8th, uh, 1986. And this was after um, we actually had won the lawsuit against the DEA. The judge said it should uh, MDMA should be available as a medicine, um, illegal for recreational use, but available as a medicine. And the DEA administrator rejected that recommendation and kept criminalizing it. So that's where I had to start MAPS. This is the MAPS logo as interpreted by Alex Gray. And the important thing here is that the hands are first and the psychedelic imagery is in the background. And so what this really emphasizes is that it's about therapy. The psychedelics help the therapy be more effective, but the treatment itself is primarily thought of as psychotherapy. It's not that uh, you give the drug and people automatically get better. It's not like a traditional psychiatric drug. You take it every day on your own. This is only you take a few times under direct supervision of therapists. And again, it's people helping people that will be the uh, primary active ingredient in helping people overcome PTSD and many other things. What does the therapy itself look like? It's an alliance between the therapist and participants. The therapeutic alliance is the key factor. This empathic rapport and presence, we support the participants' own healing process, emphasis on preparation and integration and trust in the process. The key point here is that we see ourselves as trying to help people learn how to heal themselves. We're facilitating their own healing process, but they have to do the hard work. The direction of the session sourced from the participants' experiences. It's not like we overlay on top of it. Here's our structure. Here's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Here's prolonged exposure. Here's our techniques. Here's our exercises. It's not that we support what's ever emerging from each person. And it's this inner directed therapeutic approach, this belief that there's this inner healing intelligence and we support it as it emerges in whatever um, kind of order that it comes. So